how do you get into the door at these places? It goes back to what problem are you solving for someone, right? Whose problem are you really solving? Did you validate that you're actually solving it, right? And you know, what that really gets to, the real question is, do you have product market fit, right? Like, are you actually solving something that's a real problem and people find it like useful? Um, I'm interested in your take on this because so many people lament that technology, the way we use it today, uh, specifically social media, causes us to communicate less or less effectively, right? And what do you say to that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. If anything, uh, if the pandemic has showed us anything, it has shown us that both of those things are kind of true, right? And so like when I think about some of the things that we've done at Holler, from a, a research perspective, we one of the things that we to look for is how people are using different types of technologies and platforms to connect with each other. And when we did our last report, uh, our, our the media and our messages report, we found that during the pandemic, 42% of people messaged more uh, now than they did before COVID, right? And the reason when I when it kind of goes when you think about that. If you think about the kind of natural um, behavior that is create, that created the demand for messaging platforms in the first place was people being apart. And so when we went into quarantine culture, we only saw more of that type of behavior. Um, but you know, the, the, what people did during that time is that they relied on technology to keep close with each other. If you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people were staying connected to family members, especially when the, the, the quarantine restrictions were so 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 tight. They used platforms tight. like House Party, right? Zooms. Every platform created a new capability to allow people to see each other face to face. Even if you look at what happened in a dating space, we saw some of the dating platforms launch video capabilities in order to uh, create a feeling of staying more connected and getting to know people um, during a time where people were alone and feeling lonely. And so I do think that technology has uh, created avenues for people to get, stay connected and get and get and be closer. And I couldn't imagine a world over the last you know 16 months where we didn't have technology. But that being said, you know one of the reasons why I founded Holler was because you know technology still has so much missing in terms of real human connection, mm. right? And you know when you think about uh, let's go back even to the most basic level of communication, right? And you know, one of the when we when we moved our communication into text-based platforms, one of the fun we we lost critical pieces of information that's usually conveyed in face-to-face -face communication. Yeah. So there was a recent study. There was a study done that, that by UCL, UCL, UCLA that showed that when you form your opinion of me only 7% is based off the words that I used, right? 30% uh, is based off my tone of voice and the rest is based off of my bat body language, right? And so most of communication is non-text-based or non-verbal. And so when we're in these digital environments and we're using them to connect with each other, then the, the, the fundamental part of how we connect is lost in many ways. Um, and so, you know, that's what, why we've seen some of the types of effects that uh, social media has created, for example, where people have feel like uh, feeling disconnected, feeling alone, even though they're connected to more people than ever. And so there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of things to be said about that. And so, you know, I, I think as an as a, as a industry, you know, me as a technologist, I, start, I think heavily about how you know, we uh, fix, harness and capitalize on the power of what technology brings us while taking a, a, a stern look on the ramifications of what it's done in the past and create sustainable programs or practices that help solve that. And every single industry goes through that type of transformation as well. Like 
we when you when you look at what happened with fossil fuels right in the industrial revolution you would say like that was a massively productive innovation right and the utilization of fossil fuels back in the back in those days brought about a lot of learning and innovation and human advancement that you know have formed the backbone of how we exist as a society today yeah. but we've learned over time as that that industry matured that fossil fuels have negative ramifications with respect to our earth and our planet and many other things. And so we have to go through innovation and reinvention to make sure that we go, we, we, we progress and we, we kind of get rid of the negative impacts of those things. And I think that's the same thing we're going to see with technology. Yeah. And uh, you either wrote this or I saw this in another interview where you talked about our why is not to deliver stickers and be funny, but to foster empathy and understanding between all people online. And I was, um, it re reminded me of a TED talk. I went to TED, I think it was like 10 years ago. And there was a linguist from Columbia University. His name is John McPorter, who had a talk, a TED talk called Texting is Killing Language. Just kidding. Right. And his his thesis was essentially that the way we text the LOLs, you know, the the all, all the BRBs, and et cetera, was not necessarily killing the way we think about it. It's a whole other language in itself. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, are emojis, GIFs, et cetera, are they a new language altogether or are they an extension of the language we already use? Because there's there's context, there's nuance, yep. right? So you, you're, you're striking on a really important point, right? Which is there are certain things that in a text-based communication channel that cannot be conveyed yeah. by words, right? Like there's certain, there, there's, it, there's, there's like misunderstanding. That's why like the term misunderstandings made it to the dictionary, right? Like it's a misunderstanding, but in messages, right? Because I like, if, if I say like, I could say the word, I don't know, in so many different, the, the phrase I don't know in so many different ways is it, like, I don't know, I don't know, right? Like there's so many aspects of those three <laughs> words that you, you would completely change the interpretation of how someone would understand that message. What visuals, what visuals do, visuals really help to correct that. And, you know, in, in, in the report that we did in January of this year, we found that 57% of people, 57% use visuals only, have visual only conversations in their chat apps. They're not using words at all, right? Like I have two nephews, like when I, if you look at them, talk to each other, like my, my mother would think it's just hieroglyphics, right? Like <laughs> yeah. we have our family group chat, like, you know, you could, you could, uh, you, you know, when the Gen Zers are going off, like <laughs> it's like really obvious. Um, but then, but you look at that number, that number used to be, we did that same study last year, 2020, that number was 50%. So it's not only that it was, it, it, that people are using visual only conversations, but they're having more visual conversations as we, as we go throughout time. And so why is that, right? Why do you use that? Like the, to your point, visuals help to convey, convey nuance and other things that are impossible to convey with words, right? Gifts provide scenes, stickers, overlay, ex ex other messages and expressions. These are the types of things that uh, are, the, these, the, and memes and other things, these are yeah. physically become the language of the internet. And one of the, one of the things, all of the, these things play into a broader category that I call conversational media. Right. And conversational media is defined as the various types of media that people use in uh, peer to peer environments, stickers, gifts, memes and lenses and filters and all those things, mo emojis. These are visual communication tools. Right. These are the types of tools that people bring into their messages in order to help people to help them express and express themselves appropriately. And they're critical to, to, to having a, uh, a meaningful conversation. And when you look at, like, even when you look at why people choose one messaging platform or over another, 
one of the biggest driver. So the first driver of choice is the ability to uh, make calls. Okay. The second driver of choice uh, when deciding what messaging platform to use is the, the, the text messaging capability. The third driver of choice, right, beside, right behind the basic functionality is the, 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 the various visual communication tools available. So it, the, I, I choose platforms like if I, you know, people use Snapchat, for example, Snapchat, like, like, you know, a lot of Gen Zers and millennials use Snapchat because those platforms provide unique, it, it, it's really good at providing so many unique ways of self-expressions and it makes my conversation better with my friends. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it is a new language, right? It's, it's adding to language, right? It's not necessarily replacing it. So you're not, you know, trying to get people to use your app. Like you're powering other apps as your platform design for integration, essentially. And is, is that an easier path to product adoption? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's certainly not an easy path because dealing with, you know, dealing with big platforms and publicly traded companies and getting them to integrate what, which, you know, at the earliest days, our early stage startup is not a job for the week, right? Like, you know, sometimes, I mean, some of those, some of those deals can take years to put into place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't necessarily, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a philosophy, right? Or a strategy to adoption. And, you know, there's, there's, different you know different different business models might take might call for different things for us at holler the reason why i i took the approach of having us distributed through other apps is because that at the core that's the problem that i saw that we could solve and so when you think about like when i started the business i started with our mission statement which was very simple it's three words it's enriched conversations everywhere that's our mission statement, very simple. And when we had that mission, uh, when we put that mission statement into place, we, we started with the word, we used the word enrich because we always wanted to innovate around what it meant to enrich a conversation. We used conversation because we could always expand on what it meant to be a conversation, right? It could be a, a chat, dating, even a payment note on Venmo. And then lastly, we said, uh, uh, everywhere because we didn't want to build our own tech plat uh, messaging platform. We wanted to be where all the conversations were happening, right? We wanted to be the Switzerland of messaging, so to speak. And that made sense for us because what we found was that there are over a hundred trillion messages sent across all of these different environments already each year. And there had not been much innovation in the peer-to-peer -peer messaging experience for people since the first text message was sent in 1992. And so for me, I wanted to focus on innovation around the stuff in our messages today, right? Not create a new destination for you, but make sure that we created a, a we, we, we innovated around all of your experiences that you had everywhere and made them better. And that's what we did. And that's why it made sense for us. But there's other, there's certainly other ways, there other paths that might be as productive. Um, but for us, you know, the product, it was a productive, um, it was a good path to adoption, but it was because it was really anchored around our core mission as a business. Um, so you, you mentioned something that, you know, there's longer life cycles of these, these sales cycles, I should say, these, these longer sales cycles to, instead of, trying to find a hundred thousand people or a million people to download your app you're trying to find like that one person at a snapchat or you know an apple or some other you know enterprise who is looking for integrations and you now you've got to sell to them talk to me about like what that what is that sales cycle what does that process look like how do you get that in to those corporations to be able to even have the conversation about integrating your new startup into their platform and so one, you throw one man over the wall, you tell one man to bury through it and then you grab <laughs> the front door. <laughs> no, no, but like, honestly, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, from a, a, like I'm heavily involved in the uh, partnership strategy and having those pitches, doing those pitches. But one of the things that 
uh, we think about is who's, whose problem are we solving at the organization, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we target, like who is the, the person that when they see us reach out, like that is like, we solved their problem for the year, right? Or who could we make look like a hero, right? In, in their organization. And so for us, when we, when we come to organ, like, you know, when we partner with, with applications, we don't just say, hey, we wanna add stickers and gifts to your app, right? Like what we, we, what we go is say, we wanna make conversations on your app better, right? And, you know, what for us, we focus on, on we, we fully appreciate and understand that every app and every genre of app, whether you're a dating app or a payment app or what, app, what have you, the problem that they experience and the challenges that end consumers have when having conversations in these applications are different. Like in our, in our, in our report, we found that uh, in dating applications, one of the biggest challenges that users face is the cold start problem. They don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. So how do we at Holler help people on those applications strike and spark better conversations, right? And we do this type of analysis and research across every single category that we do. And then when we reach out to these applications, we go, we use an insights driven approach to say, hey, you know, this is what we've learned through our research about people that use applications like yours. Like, we would love to help you solve that. Right. And, you know, who's who's tasked with solving that problem? You know, so those are the types of uh, ways we you know, we we are very insights driven. We use we, we come in as con like consultative. We try to be as we we, sh we strive to be a strategic partner uh, that helps actually dr drive your business and grow business and, and, and bring business results. And you know that's the reason why we have such really great relationships with some of the, these large corporations and public uh, with public really at scale public apps. Um, so yeah, I mean that uh, you know that's how they do it, and then you know they use they more technically speaking they embed our software and off to the races, right? Yeah, like how do you build that trust though? Because I imagine so many people may you know throw a guy over the wall like to, to your point you know knock on the door send the email make the call and they're like okay who are you your startups you know how old etc like does it work that way in this world or is it like people are more apt to take that call um if you just have something that has a value no i mean well it starts with so this starts with there's there's i mean you imagine that these people are getting calls about somebody wanting to solve their problems every day right so there's a multi-pronged thing, right? There's the, there's the, whose problem are you solving, right? How have you as a company established leadership or show your authority in that? So one of the things that we do at Holler constantly is, I mean, we coined the term conversational media, right? And now it's a thing, right? You know, I was like, somebody invented social media somewhere someday, right? So like, why can't we be the same, right? And so what we, you know, what we as a practice at Holler is like we walk what we preach, right? And so we talk about conversational media, we share our insights with the world, we live it every single day. And you know, that 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 when you when you look us up and looked at who we we're about, like if you know, they are focused on creativity, they are focused on privacy. They are focused on all of these critical issues that although we were a new company, we could talk about and point to the things that we've done that showed that we were somebody that they should be talking to. And so there's, a, there's like a lot of the sale happens not in the room, right? Yeah. It's how your business, if you're a founder, you and as you build your brand as a founder as well, like how you establish credibility and authority and leadership for your, you and your business around this particular subject matter. And you'll be surprised how that, is, that the investment in that will pay equities in your business as you are going out engaging with potential clients and partners as you're willing to, you're getting prepared to grow and scale. So are you saying the startups who want to sell specifically to other businesses, but maybe even to the public also, they should be blogging, they should be vlogging, they should be on podcasts, they should be starting podcasts. Is that what you're saying? 
I mean, yeah, it should be everything in between. Like, what is your strategy? Like, why? So the fun, you know, you could invoke many different tactics, but why? One of the things is like, why are you believable? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, why me? I'm company A, you're coming into my office and telling me I should do something. Why are you believe? What is your believability in this matter? Right? And why should I be getting on board? And so the anything that you could do to establish, continue to establish your presence, your believability, your authority, your leadership is something, especially when you're doing B2B sales, is something that's going to be beneficial in the, in, in the long run. I like that. And so I always, I'm often in these conversations with startup founders and, you know, just people around the table and we're asked, you know, I, how come company X just doesn't build what you're doing, you know? And so I wonder, and so, the, I think the most logical answer is like, we're going to move fast enough where it's more likely that they just buy us than for, for them to build it themselves. And I wonder at what point is it too hard to unwind an integration, you know, a third party app? How, how do you get so embedded that it makes sense for them to either just buy or continue using? Like, why don't other, why don't their developers just build this, this technology? Yeah. So, uh, this is a mixture of two questions. Like, so it's like, what are the barriers to entry is one, right? Um, and then, you know, why that, like, what are, why don't people do this in the first place? So one of the things that it's important to note that companies have competencies, even when they're big and so things that, and they, and what they use there in general, even we think about this at Holler at this stage, right? companies use their competencies like they lean into their competencies and what they're good at right so like we are one of our biggest partners is venmo venmo is a payments company at the core they're not a media company they don't do content right it's just not in their dna and dnas are important cultures are important right and so you know what we do is is perfect, right? So we, we provide a service that is beneficial to their users and creates a good experience, but it's something that they would never build. Like they wouldn't have an animation studio, right? Yeah. At, at, at PayPal, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, one of the things um, when we think about this is like, what, what are we as a company going to be the best at? What do we have the possibility of being the best at? And we focus on those things. And you have to really be authentic and honest with yourself and say, well, what are we also not going to be, ever be the best at? And so as at Holler, we're like, you know what? The, there's a lot of chat platforms and things like that at scale. We're never gonna be the best chat platform, but we can be the best conversational media company. Like, mm -hmm. and that focus is on the stuff in, the mess in your messages. And that's why we focus there. And, you know, so that's why like people choose, right? Because businesses at the end of the day are focusing on their competencies. And if we're wholly focused on being the best conversational media company, it'll probably be very hard for somebody else to do that as a side hustle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like what I'm, what I'm like, so what I'm, um, so what we're focused on is just that. But at the same time, you know, when you start businesses, um, and this is just like a, a kind of note to uh, founders and entrepreneurs, like you always get that in, in, in that question, like what is your sustainable competitive advantage? Why, why can't this person do this, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, I, so when I was fundraising in the early days, I hated that question. I freaking, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna curse on the podcast, but I freaking hated that question. So yeah, yeah. the reason why is because like, you know, I started this company yesterday. Yeah, like if Google picked up and did this all tomorrow, like they could probably beat me. It's me and one, I'm one man, I'm one man, right? Yeah. But the reality is, is the advantage that startups have is speed, right? So when you when you are starting a company, don't lose your your competitive advantage, which is speed for perfection or anything else. Your superpower is speed. They physically can't do this as fast as you, right? Because they it's like turning the Titanic, right? They just can't they just can't do it. And you know what? What great startups do is they they exercise their superpower, which is speed, so much that they start to gain other advantages over time and build big moats. 
And then the, the, by the time, you know, hopefully you never become the type, well, hopefully you do become the Titanic, but like, you know, by the time you get there, you're like, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're big, right? Like, you know, you have moats and you have all these things that you built over time if you had the right strategy. But like the thing that you, 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 you really have to focus on is just speed, right? And building your moats and, and, and focusing on the right things and executing and focus and all those things that, that make uh, the greatest executors um, win. Yeah, I, I, like, I like what you said about like leaning into your competency. So I wonder from the other perspective, is, util, is utilizing integration tech, like existing technology like Holler, Bootstrap, Stripe, et cetera, is that an easier way to build a startup? Like what's the advantage from a startup perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that you, companies shouldn't focus on things. So even at Holler, like, you know, things that we don't think we need to be like, we don't need to build that solution, right? Like that is something that is not German. Like we use tons of different technologies to build up our, like to build our stack. The things that we focus on are the things that are core to our business. Like our innovation happens in the core. Like we like our we have our AI research team. We focus on edge computing, on device AI. That thing we invest in, we we build it. Like that's our thing, right? Like that, you know, that no one we're not using anybody for that. But other things and other tools, like we're like, you know, for example, I don't need to build an analytics platform like for our data insights pipeline. Like, you know, I'll use Tableau, right? Like you use these things to help you get the job done that are non-strategic. So it is the buy bar buy partner build question, mm. right? And in many cases, it makes more sense to partner, right? Than build and even buy, right? So that's the the, the you, I I like it actually. And going back to speed, you shouldn't build things that you should that are not important, right? <laughs> like to yeah. your your business, you want to move fast. So if there's a tool that you could use that moves you along faster, that is non-strategic or non-core, use that tool, hammer through the door and keep going. Like, don't even worry about it. I love that. How do you get other developers to pay you? Like, what, like, is this a licensing situation? Like, how does this work? So Holler's model is, uh, it's a, so it's quite unique. So we actually give uh, access to the platforms for free. Right, so we allow the messaging platforms to integrate our, give them license to our SDK. We uh, uh, we give them uh, license to our content as well, our IP, uh, for free. But then we work with brands on the other end. So you know, we work with some of the largest brands in the world, everyone from Starbucks to Honda. Like we're like, you know, selling ice cream and moving cars and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, so, you know, we, we, we do that and we issue, we've created a new channel for brands to be a part of this environment in a way that's uh, really helping their businesses. And so um, it's a really unique model, but it, it's been beautiful for our business. What kind of traction, if any, do you need from your view to, to show potential investors, to get them to believe that you're gonna 10X their capital with integration technology? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I look at our, our, our last funding round, um, you know, so Holler's raised over $51 million at this point, uh, in investments and, you know, it's different, it's different at each milestone, right? So in the earliest days, um, you know, when you're at your seed rounds, right. And getting started, you usually don't have much, right? So really it's the story that you're telling and the vision that you're presenting and the future that you're presenting and the 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 going back to the believability but like the confidence it, instilling a sense of confidence that you're like i need you to believe in this vision and mission in this world and instilling the level of confidence that you're the right person to do it right or you and your team is the right person to do it those are the most important things in the early days, right? Like people, people kind of, um, you know, it's great. The, you always want as much as possible to show. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like when you're so early and you're pitching, like it, it's really mostly that, like, do I, am I convinced, right? When you get later on 
into the later stages, series A, series B, you start to show metrics, right? And, you know, the, the metrics need to become more solid over time, right? So like in, in, in you know, in 2020, 2020, you know, our, we grew from 19 million users to 75 million users of our, of our platform in the year, right? So we 3X'd and those types of things. And those are the types of metrics that help establish our Series B. And we brought brands and clients and we did all sorts of stuff, right? Um, but, you know, we're asking for more money and we're, we should have, been, we should be farther along. So it just depends on what type of, uh, where you are in your journey uh, in order to make that a reality. You just mentioned this, and recently, thirty-six million dollars Series B. Congratulations! Um, and talk about like brand partnerships. Because I was I was looking at like what you guys do, and I see like you know Deli on Tequila Chips, and like like where does this go? Like, because I I imagine you know it's really great to do these emojis and etc. With brands, you know, maybe there's a Honda car. Like to your point, maybe there's you know an emoji with etc. Et your favorite brand, it's a Starbucks cup. Where does this go? What's the, like, where, where, does, where can this go? Yeah. So the channel is conversational media. So we're focused in all the media that lives in your messages. And there, one category is the visual communication tools. Like, so the stickers, gifts, all those types of things. And those provide a unique venue for people to be part of conversations, brands to be part of conversations. So I could be a part of that conversation when she's feeling beautiful, right? Or when somebody's hungry, like I could, you know, McDonald's could be there. I could drive top of mind of brands when I'm craving Snickers could be there. Like we could put brands uh, at top of mind in those moments, right? And, you know, we have ideas of how you even drive lower funnel, not just branding and awareness, but lower funnel activity. We've done studies with brands that actually show that we've been, we drive our, our, our advertising methodology drives brand lift, awareness, variability. We put people in, we drive actually even um, in store visits and things like that in the past. And, you know, that's for visual communication tools. But I already know, so one of the things that when we started with it, Holler actually stands for my conversation concierge. So when something's missing, Holler. And, uh, you know, the, the, what we do know is that uh, our technology, which is the science side of our business, is a contextual AI. It's all about understanding the context of conversation in a privacy compliant way and making and serving up the most appropriate content. And so with that part, uh, we, we already identify that there's so many different needs that people have in their messages outside of just uh, expression and, you know, being able to you leverage visual communication tools. So we have a really robust mo ro roadmap of all of these different types of experiences that we're going to enable in your messages that solve so many different needs uh, for consumers, especially when you think about messaging is where you talk about where you want to go, what you want to do, the thing that you're interested in, the game last night, like all of those things that we're really thinking about. We're really th thinking about the nuance of all those conversational moments. This one of my favorite quotes uh, from Steve Jobs is this, um, he says, technology is nothing. You know, what's important is that you have faith in people that they're basically good and smart. And if you give them the tools, they'll do wonderful things with them. Yes, that's one of my favorite Steve Jobs quote. Um, because too many of us, I think, you know, maybe looking for to start a tech company just because they have this cool tech, you know, I've got to get this cool thing out the door, right? And versus, you know, perhaps improving the human condition. It doesn't mean you can't do the cool thing, but you know, there are some real core issues that we could, could you know, solve for. And I want to talk about finding interesting things to work on for people who are looking to build companies, but might be on a path less likely to succeed. It goes back to something that I, I mentioned earlier, like, like when you asked me the question about um, how do you get into the door at these places? It goes back to what problem are you solving for someone, right? Whose problem are you really solving? Did you validate that you're actually solving it, right? And, you know, what I really gets to, the real question is, do you have product market fit, right? Like, are you actually solving something that's a real problem and people find it, like, useful? 
if that's true, right, and you saw that, then you ask your, the second question, which is what is the model, right? So like, that's why you see in a lot of social media companies, like they like, we don't know, we don't care about making money today, right? We are like, okay, we're going to, we're solving some problem for someone. And we could imagine different ways we might, might make money off of it, but let's make sure we're solving a real problem first. And then, you know, they drive engagement, they drive scale. And then they're like, okay, we are solving a big problem. Now, how do you start making money off of this, right? Like, you know, you have Clubhouse. Clubhouse doesn't make any money. Like, they, they're like, people have this desire to sit, have open conversations and just chat. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, are we solving a real problem? And it's, indic- and, and it's measured by utilization, like actual transaction or commerce or whatever it may be, right? You have the, 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 the KPI or the, the mechanism of product market fit is not always monetary. Um, and so you have to really get really good at uh, understanding and articu- articulating what's the mechanism that drives your business model or business, right? Like, and, 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 and focus on that. Once you understand that, then you apply the model and then you can do the math, right? Like what does that actually mean in the long, long run? But if you're, if you're, if you're, one of the things that I've seen, and I, I've said this many times, the startups that fail are the startups that are are not capable of processing information quick enough and iterating, right? So you need to know when you've won, and you need to know when you've failed, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't, because if you don't know if you've won or if you don't know when you failed then you keep spinning your wheels until you just like run out of money or you just like, you know, it doesn't go anywhere and people find themselves in a rut. And sometimes they find themselves in a rut for years. So it's really being able, it is okay to fail that you, if you want to win, but it's okay to fail. You just fail. Well, like one of the things that uh, we say at holler is how will we crash the car gracefully? Right? Like we're going to go after it. We're so we're okay. We're losing, but if you crash the car, just like don't total it. Like just like crash the car gracefully. Don't don't like you know like don't kill everybody. In it, right? yeah, yeah. So, so we have that concept, and you know that's that's the thing. Like we're not afraid to like I'm not afraid. Our teams are not afraid to like do something bold um, to make a difference. But you know we have we make sure that we put the guardrails and understand you know what things are right when we go out and do those types of things and lastly when you think about specifically black founders um because you mentioned COVID earlier and the the growth that you had during COVID and the opportunity COVID even created how important is this moment in time for specifically black founders whether that be in raising capital getting traction finding product market fit how, how would you answer that? look I think right now I've been very I, I have a lot of enthusiasm and excitement around how much energy there's been in wanting to support black founders specifically. Right. And so, you know, if it's, it's, if to everyone who's listening who's black founder, show up time, like it's game time. Do, 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 uh, you know, bring your best ideas. Don't be bold, you know, share your ideas and thoughts. Like people want to hear them. I've been like very, very, um, excited about all of the positivity uh, and the progress, especially over the last 12 months. And I think it's only going to accelerate. And so, you know, I, I, I think now more than ever, like there's a big acknowledgement of how bad like investment in supporting black founders has been. Uh, and, you know, I've been working with a lot of investors and other industry folks who want to make a difference and they truly want to make a difference. And so, Lean in, uh, you know. Work hard on your concepts. Get uh, build your businesses and get let the world know you're out there, right? Because people are looking for diversity, and and you know we, you know me even personally, I'm always um, looking to connect black founders with um, either influencers or, or expertise or capital uh, who could help. So, and there's a lot of people like me. So I think uh, it's a good time and. You know, we should, people should be really enthusiastic.